All right. Here we go. Welcome everybody to Westwood Unitarian Sunday service. And we uh, have a moment here. If you have any announcements you would like to type into the chat to share with folks, um, this is the best time to do that. And then we will begin with our opening song. It's number 134 in Singing the Living Tradition, Our World is One World, played by Sheila Kalorna. <laughs> As we begin any service or event at Westwood, we wish to acknowledge that the land on which the Westwood building is situated is Treaty 6 territory and the traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous people, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. And we recognize that not everyone here today resides in Edmonton, Alberta. We invite you to reflect on the history of your location, the people who first resided there and the complex relationships that have occurred throughout history. If you'd like to, you're welcome to share in the chat where you are and the land recognition that uh, best fits. June is Pride Month in Edmonton and many places, and that is an invitation in this call to land liberation for us to learn and understand the indigenous peoples experience of gender and sexual diversity and the impacts of colonialism on their long established societies. As treaty people, we work to respond to the 94 calls to action that came out of the truth and reconciliation hearings and to be good and responsible neighbors to the people who predate us in this place. Welcome to the Westwood Unitarian Sunday morning service. A special welcome to our newcomers who are new to Unitarian Universalist Services or to Westwood. We are especially grateful to have you with us this morning. Westwood is a compassionate community of free religious thought, inviting all people to rest, grow, and serve the world. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here. My name is Reverend Ann Barker, and I have the honor of serving as minister to this congregation. We have wonderful volunteers, staff, and musicians helping out this morning with the service, most of them named on the screen before you. And there are so many others who work behind the scenes, keeping the wheels turning and the Zoom lights on. Our speaker this morning is Lynn Markham, a Westwood member. And we appreciate that she is both available and willing to help us launch the start of Pride Month here. Lynn speaks from wisdom and understanding as well as from lived experience. We are grateful for her willingness to share stories and lessons with us today. Now, if you have a candle or a chalice nearby, it's time to bring it forward. Otherwise, we've got you covered. 
We begin with a chalice lighting to set an intent for our gathering. And today's chalice lighting comes from this book, Side by Side, Fulfilling a Dream, which is a Canadian Unitarian Universalist worship resource with both English and French content. But because of my French illiteracy, I will be reading the English this morning. And Maddie quit laughing at me. All right, so this is entitled To Weave the Threads of Our Lives by the Reverend Wayne Arneson. From separate lives, from different paths we have come, from distinct joys and private sorrows we have come, from unique insights and personal convictions we have come. We have come and we are here to make a common life at the crossroads of our paths to expand our joys and share the burdens of our sorrows, to deepen our insights and announce our convictions. We are here and we have come to weave the threads of our lives into the whole cloth of religious community. We light our chalice candles this morning in the spirit of community, of being together. One of the traditions in many Unitarian Universalist congregations is to celebrate the joys and concerns of our life. It's an opportunity for people to share what's going on for them, to lift up what is going well, and to make connection around what is challenging. On the first Sunday of the month, we invite people, if they would like, they can speak their joys and concerns aloud. And so all you need to do is put up a hand in your window or your Zoom hand and I'll call on you. And please know that we do edit out the live joys and concerns and the chat can't be seen in the final recording that is posted. So if you wish to speak aloud, it won't be shared in the public recording after the service. Then following the live joys and concerns, then we play the piece of music by Sheila that Sheila is playing and then you have the opportunity to type into the chat if you'd rather share your joys and concerns that way. So we'll begin with live joys and concerns. If anybody has something they'd like to say aloud to the group, uh, just raise a hand and we'll go from there. I'm going to uh, light a virtual candle of gratitude that we are in a place in the world where pride celebrations can be held in person and publicly again. As we enter into Pride Month here, there is so much that is important in the lives of uh, LGBTQ, two-spirit, queer folks that um, really needs human face-to-face -face connection. And I am so grateful that we're back in a space where that's beginning, even if there isn't yet an Edmonton parade. All right, so now we will invite uh, Sheila to play with the click of a button, um, water music. It's a spirit of life instrumental. And you can type your joys and sorrows in the chat if you would like.
So we light one final candle for all the joys and concerns that we hold close in our hearts. May this always be a place where it is safe and welcoming to share our innermost feelings. Now, if you will remain muted, but join me in the affirmation you see on the screen. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Now it is time um, where we just appreciate and recognize that the Westwood community is made possible by people like you for your contributions. We are a self-funded organization. And if you would like to make a contribution, the many ways you can do that are posted on the chat. Since we've been on Zoom, we've been trying to use this time um, rather than to make a big you know, pitch and pass the offering plates in the building to lift up some of the good things that are occurring. So there's two things I wanna name this morning. One is that it has been primarily board members who have showed up at the Westwood Unitarian Building every Sunday morning for many weeks now to open it up. So folks who want to view the Zoom service together in person can gather and do that in the sanctuary space. And then the other one that I want to lift up is one of our little unsung, uh, almost in the background heroes. And that's that every Sunday morning, Elara has been running our tech for the service and Bill Lee has been Elara's tech partner. And uh, you may not all know, but Bill is the person who edits our Sunday service files after the service is over and causes them to be posted to the internet so people who weren't here live can watch them. And we have quite a few people who tell me they watch them you know, later in the day or later in the week. And it is a great gift and treasure to have that. So thank you, Bill, for doing that for us. All right, now let's uh, mute it again. Join Rebecca singing our offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together makes me happy every time we play it. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning. Lynn Markham is relatively new to Westwood. And in her short time with us, she has invested herself in the community, participating in Sunday services and in programming, attending the service leaders training and acting as a service leader twice already, as well as being willing when asked to do this service this morning. Personally, I know Lynn to be caring, compassionate, supportive, and ready to lend a hand whenever she can. Lynn has a strong history with PFLAG, a support group for friends and families coming to understand their loved one's identities and experiences, and is both a speaker and group leader. We are grateful that she is now sharing her leadership gifts with us this morning. Lynn, over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, we gotta start. Um, I've been in the trades for almost 20 years. I've been out as transgender, as a transgender woman for six of those years. Um, I'm also gonna be referring to trades as a trade craft. In my case, it has only been one and I'm a cabinet maker. My story today starts from a point partway through my transition and 17 years into my trade, 11 years working at the same place. My coming out timeline starts when I came out to myself back in 2015, 2016. That's when I came out to my friends and family. Next, I started the path of coming out to the rest of the world. This is where we are going to begin. Also valuable backstory, I started my trade in 2003. 
So at this time, um, I was working at this place. I was there for about 11 years. Um, I wasn't out at work yet. I was living two different lives. Um, at work, I was boy mode. That's how I describe it. Um, it was very difficult to live two different lives. So it was so hard just to wake up and having to put on all my work clothes and go to work knowing who I was and then still hiding that from work. And for the most part, I mean, if you're a working person like myself, um, you spend a lot of time at work, more time at work than most other places. So literally I was just living two different lives and it was really, really hard. Um, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. There was a time where I actually covered up my mirrors so I couldn't see myself. That is what I needed to do in order to wake up and go to work. Just, I just couldn't, couldn't look at myself. Um, and so moving forward, I knew I had to come out of work. It was a long time coming and I just knew I couldn't keep up the double life for as long as I was. Um, I was already doing it for about a year and it was, it was just, I was in a bad place. Um, that being said, I knew that when I came out at work that it wouldn't be a supportive place. So me being who I am, um, I convinced my boss to hire someone new. And it was actually one of my friends who knew I was trans, but also knew that I wasn't out at work and knew all of it. Um, regardless, my thinking in it was I was trying to get my boss to hire my replacement before I was gone. That way I had opportunity to train new person on procedures and what needed to be done. So when I came out and I got fired, he wouldn't be out of worker. Um, that being said, around like shortly after um, my friend got hired, as you can imagine, someone who is living two different lives, um, I had a lot of time away from work. So there was definitely times where I woke up and my anxiety was just through the roof and I couldn't get out of bed. So I would call in sick more times than I would like to admit. I definitely called in sick. Um, on one of these occasions, my boss called me and pretty much just asked me, like, what's going on because you're not sick so like like what is it um and this is kind of when i broke down um it was my tipping point and i just let it all out and i told him everything told him i was trans um all of that and pretty much his response to it was does it affect your ability to work and I said, no. And he's like, okay, then I'll see you tomorrow. And that was the end of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> now, the next day, I showed up for work. Um, he also showed up around the same time. And he typically didn't show up until like 10 o'clock. And we started at 7. But he was there at 7 that day. And he pulled me aside. And he told me that he Googled what transgender was, and he went on WebMD, and his exact words were, um, I know everything I need to know now, like, more or less being like, I know it all, because I Google it, and he's like, this isn't okay, fine. Um, from that point, too, he also told me that he told his wife, and that his wife was going to be in later that day, and that she wanted to talk to me which was a good thing, but also not so great because he never asked permission to tell his people. In that same conversation, he told me that he, that I had to tell everyone else at the shop that I was like who I was, that I was trans. Um, 
and he gave me a timeline by the end of the week or he was going to do it, which is not okay. Um, luckily, it was a small place and there was only one other person who didn't know. So, but that was also a hard one too, because I mean, I worked with this person for 11 years. Um, back when I was married, he was my best man at my wedding. Like I was close with him, but at the same time, I knew his stance on it and I knew it wouldn't really work out. Um, yeah, so I ended up doing that. I ended up telling him it turned out better than I thought. Although it was really weird after that. Um, my boss ended up emailing all the people that we worked with within the trades, um, other trades as well. So um, the businesses we worked with and all of that, he emailed them and told them that I came out as transgender, which is also something you should never do. Um, it was it was hard. It was really hard. And I remember to, and I didn't find this out until after, and we'll get to that later, and it'll come full circle. But apparently he pulled everyone aside in the shop and told them that they aren't allowed to make like inappropriate jokes and things like that, which has, I mean, I worked in the trades, it happens all the time, it still happens. Um, it's just, it's unfortunately part of the culture. Anyway, so he told everyone else that, you know, these type of jokes are not allowed, but no one told me. So I was still making jokes and being the me, the normal me that I always was. Um, and in the end, I think that wasn't the right thing to do um, because you can't change rules for some people and then not for others. It just makes things difficult. Um, okay, so moving forward, timeline-wise, this was probably another, I don't know, a couple months or so. It, one day at work, um, at coffee break, I told everyone that I wanted everyone to call me Lynn. And to use she, her pronouns. Now, this was so hard like I don't I can't articulate how difficult it actually was for me to have that conversation with everyone at work um I still wasn't 100 percent sure about Lynn I was more or less trying it on for size that sort of thing and there was a lot of anxiety just to go in and like I, I planned it like you know I marked it on the calendar this is the day I'm gonna do it um Anyway, so after telling everyone, um, my one friend, obviously, he already knew, so he was totally cool and fine with it. My other coworker, he was like, yeah, I can try that. And I even said, like, if you make mistakes, that's fine. Um, just do your best and, like, correct the mistake. You don't have to apologize, nothing. Just correct it and move on. Um, that's all I needed and wanted. After I said that, my boss pretty much got up from his chair and walked into his office, which was, wasn't that far away. He pretty much took a couple steps into his office and then turned around and walked out. And in front of everyone, he asked me, he's like, so what do I put on your check? And I, I just told him, be like, well, you're still gonna have to sign it in my legal name. Like, there's no way around that. And then he says, if you're gonna do something, you may as well do it all the way and turned around and walked away. Now that, that was like a knife in the gut. It was just like, yeah, that's not, like it's not that easy. Um, so from that point, I really felt that I had to get my legal name changed to prove to this person that I was trans, which is wrong because really all I needed to do was prove it to myself. And I did by coming out, um, not just to him, but to everyone. Anyway, so I started that process of changing my legal name. Um, it's not an easy process. It's not a short process. 
So, yeah, I did that. Um, <laughs> look at my notes, sorry. Um, after that, there's lots of other little things that happened. Um, I remember specifically, like, I'm pretty sure I can mark it down on the calendar the day that I lost my privilege. And when I say that, I mean, like, privilege between being male and female. So the story with that was um, I was already, I can't remember if I was running PFLAG or if I was attending PFLAG because I definitely attended PFLAG before I ran it. So it was one of the situations where I had to go somewhere after work and I didn't have time to go home and change. So I decided I was gonna bring everything to work and change at work. So after work was done, I went into the bathroom and changed in, out of my male work clothes because I still had male work clothes um, and changed into a dress, did my hair, did some makeup, that sort of thing. When I came out of the bathroom, everyone else was still there. And literally when I walked by, it pretty much just like I was nervous anxious, so much anxiety. And I pretty much just walked by and said like, bye everyone, have a good night. And I could tell that all their jaws were like on the floor. They were like, who is this person? The next day when I showed up for work, I was treated like I didn't know how to do anything. Like I didn't know how to turn on a table saw. Meanwhile, I've been a cabinet maker for like, 16 years at that point, right? Like I, I know what I was doing. I was there for 11, like my boss was literally was explaining to me like how to pick up a sheet and put it on a table saw and cut it. And I was, I was flabbergasted. And at this point in my life, um, because I was living my true self and I had, I had a lot more respect for myself. So I was standing up for things that I didn't feel were right. So in this situation, I didn't feel what he was doing was right. So I said something. And then it became a big fight that I'm talking back. And it's like, I'm not talking back. I'm literally just trying to tell you that I, I know what I'm doing. Um, and that was really hard. And it was literally like overnight that I lost my privilege. And since then I've been struggling with that female in the trade privilege thing. And I have so much experience that I have a lot of confidence in what I do. Um, I know I can do it and I don't need someone to question it. And when someone does question it, I very much speak up and tell them in the nicest way possible to get lost and just let me do it. If, I'm, if I, it comes out wrong, then you can say something, but it won't. <laughs> Um, anyways, so I wouldn't, I don't really know exactly what the timeline was, but shortly after that, um, is the day I got fired and it was completely out of the blue and they tried to fire me for some safety policy that was never expressed to me in any way, shape or form. So more or less, they were looking for a reason to fire me. And finally they found it. And yeah, I just showed up for work one day and was told that I was fired to pack up my tools and go home. Now, the stories that I've told are just a few of some of the bad ones. In fact, they're the probably less worst ones out of all of the horror stories, uh, out of all of the horror stories. Um, so after this, after getting fired, I definitely had grounds to sue, human rights, all of that. And there was a lot of trauma. So one thing that's funny about trauma is sometimes you don't realize it until you're out of that situation. So once I was out of that situation, that's when all the trauma hit and I was like still, 
I think I just started hormones and still kind of dealing with dysphoria and um, still lots of anxiety. So I had to take a year off and that's what I did. And in that year, I sought out counseling, group therapy, like lots of work on myself and also contemplating whether or not I should file a human rights complaint and sue my former employer because it's the second employer I've only had in my career. And moving forward in, within the same career, if you sue one of your employers, it doesn't really reflect well. Not many people are gonna wanna hire you if they think you're just gonna turn around and sue them. Um, long story short, I, I definitely took a long time and thought really hard about whether or not I should and all of that. I did end up suing in the end. Um, I filed a human rights complaint. And if you've ever gone through a process of filing a human rights complaint, there are so many barriers to it, especially for someone like me who is ADHD and really not great with words. Everything has to be written and specific dates, times, like they want lots of detail. And I had to write out this entire letter of what I want out of the outcome of suing. Now, that is one thing that I struggled with huge about in my time off in that year is what, what I'm going to ask for. Most people, when they do a human rights thing, they want their job back or their position back or things like that, or money. Um, I didn't need or want any of those things. All I wanted was for them to recognize what they did was wrong, and how they treated me was wrong. So in the human rights complaint, all I asked for was a written apology and for everyone there to take diversity and inclusion training. That's all I wanted. Now, human rights complaint, they take a long time. Um, you have a year from incident before you can file one. And I waited almost a year. And then from there, it's another like two, three years before you're even kind of talking to someone about it. Throughout the whole process, um, the employer got notification that I filed this and then he lawyered up right away. And now it was me fighting a multimillionaire with lawyers and it was just me by myself. Um, I felt like I didn't have a chance. And in the end, the human rights complaint was thrown out because they kept bringing up weird things, making lies. Um, back when I was talking about like the jokes and things like that, right? No one told me that this is now like a policy and we shouldn't do that. So I was making jokes and now they're throwing that back in my face, saying that I was being inappropriate at work, making jokes that were inappropriate when everyone else wasn't. And I was like, but that was the culture. That was like, anyways, long story short, it got thrown out. And I'm kind of glad it did because every time I got a letter from human rights, every time I had to dive into it, it was just reliving all of that drama, reliving everything that happened. And at the end, I could have fought it. I could have um, appealed the dismissal and all of that. And in the end, my mental health was more important. And what I was asking for, they already knew what I was asking for. And I just hope to God that they actually went through the diversity including inclusion training and that they learned. Um, and that's all I can really hope for and ask for. So that's kind of where I left it. Now, moving forward from there, I mean, I still work in the trades. I'm still a cabinet maker. Um, after my year off, I worked at a place and I think I was there for just over a month, um, still within the probation, probationary period. And when I first applied there, I told them that I was trans and this was middle of pandemic, like very much middle of pandemic. And I still was waiting for surgery for my bottom surgery. So in the interview, I had to disclose, I didn't technically have to, but I wanted to disclose that 
hey, I might get a call for surgery and then I'm gone for three months. If you want me back, that's fantastic. If you don't, then that's fine too. But I want to be upfront with that because it's very much something that, um, I mean, it's me. It's just, and I want to be respectful to the people I work for as well. I want to be honest. Anyways, um, he was, him as an employer was very fine with it. He's like, I don't feel it's going to, like who you are, your gender, all of that doesn't matter as long as you can do the work. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, he didn't want me to tell anyone else at the shop. And this was a big shop. There was about 18 people that worked there. And he didn't want me to tell anyone else at the shop that I was trans. So about a month and a half in is when it actually, like one of my coworkers, I think I told him or something like that. And then within a week I was fired. Now this is unfortunately a, a very common thing. Um, especially within the trades. It's not, it's not something that people are very informed about. And I think a lot of it is fear on their part. They just don't know. Um, and it just scares them and it's easier just to get rid of the person, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, I think I jumped over some points here. So I might backtrack a little bit. Um, I am gonna backtrack. So in the process of the last job that I was working at, um, I ended up going to rehab because back when I was living two different lives and back before I even knew that I was trans, I was using alcohol as a coping mechanism to the point where I became dependent on alcohol. And this also very much was coming out and I was admitting it to myself and to my team of doctors and everything like that around the same time that I was trying to get hormones well coming out. So there were so many things coming going on. Like I'm coming out as transgender. I'm also admitting to myself that I'm an alcoholic and that I need help. Anyways, I had to attend rehab for how much I was drinking. I needed medical assistance to stop drinking. I actually did try and stop drinking on my, on my own. Um, and I actually had seizures, which wasn't good. And yeah, it wasn't good at all. Um, yeah, one thing that's really kind of fun I, I like about this whole story and why I'm bringing it up is I attended rehab about a week after I got my legal name changed back. Now I got my legal name changed back and it was like my gender marker, all of that. And then a week later, I had, that's when I checked myself into a detox center and things like that. Now I'm very grateful that I did that after I got all my legal documents because I went into medical facilities with female documentation. It would have been extremely hard to do it if I didn't have that and wanting to be my own true self. Um, it is exactly what I needed. And I believe it helped me tremendously, not just with the fact that um, I still don't drink. Um, but just the fact of me being able to go into a facility and going to rehab where, if you're unaware, rehab is very gendered. So all the men sleep and go over in their one corner and all the women go in the other corner and no women are allowed over there, no men are allowed over here. So you're very much segregated by gender. Now, because I had all my documentation, they, put me with the females now they also gave me the option too they said I could get like a private room and things like that which was fantastic but it's not what I needed what I needed was to be affirmed and me being in the dorms with the females 
was affirming, was very affirming. And it literally saved my life. Like if, if I didn't have that at that time and I didn't go through that and have all that affirmation and support from all the other women that were there, um, I don't know where I would be today. And one other thing that's really cool about this is since I changed my name, Lynn has never had a drink. Lynn, Lynn is a sober person and always has been. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So I think I'm pretty close to the end. Um, I know, I, I do want to point out that not every workplace is very transphobic and it's easy to find a job, especially in the trades, especially right now. That doesn't mean every single place is gonna be accepting of trans people or LGBTQ people for that matter. Um, but there are a lot of places out there that are. For me, my experience is the best thing to do is be upfront about it. Find out, feel them out in the interview, right? Tell them flat out who I am in the interview maybe even get that like shock factor or whatever, um, just to kind of see that their reaction is. And if I feel that their reaction isn't good, I'm not gonna even accept the job that if I get, if I get offered the job. Um, I'm very much interviewing everyone else when I go for interviews and the first little bit of probationary period, it's, it's me interviewing everyone else and making sure that I'm gonna fit there more than they are worried about me. Um, that goes with the amount of experience and everything that I have. I, I mean, the work speaks for itself and that's easy to see. So now it's just a matter of whether or not I fit with the people that are there. So that being said, I'm gonna more or less end it with a story. So the last place I worked, they were very, very good at just letting me be me and letting me be who I was. Um, I ended up quitting that job, but not because it had nothing to do with being trans. It had everything to do with, um, it wasn't a good fit for me. Now, one of my coworkers at this place, he seems like a really good, like he is, he's a sweetheart. Um, Hold on, I'm all over the place here this morning. I wrote it down, so I'm just gonna read it. <laughs> um, this is a affirming story, though it is very sexist, but that's why it's affirming. My coworker, Ben, was going around all day trying to get people in the shop to come work out with him after work. He was asking people and talking about it in front of me all day. And then it occurred to him that he had never asked me. So he came up and apologized for not inviting me because I was a woman and women don't work out. <laughs> even though that, even though he might not see sexism, he saw me for who I am. And that's what really mattered in that moment. And in this one too. So thank you.
Thank you, Lynn, for trusting us with your tender story. And uh, and I hope you're taking a look at the chat and all the lovely things that people are typing in there. I think we all imagine what you were telling us, that we would all anticipate that that would be true. And it's so much more powerful to hear it from someone when it is their actual lived experience. So we are very grateful for your willingness to speak with us this morning and launch us into Pride Month. Now it's time for our chalice extinguishing. So if you have a chalice lit, you wanna bring it forward. And our closing words are again from Side by Side Fulfilling a Dream, this time written by the Reverend Mark Morrison Reed, The Task of the Religious Community. The central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. It is the church that assures that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. The religious community is essential for alone our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. So we extinguish the flame, but we carry the light within our heart. And we say again in gratitude, thank you, Lynn, for widening our vision this morning. And now, uh, Elara will click the magic button to play our closing song performed once again by Sheila Kaloran, number 170 in Singing the Living Tradition, um, a favorite queer anthem from Holly Near. And we recognize that there is some gendered language in it, but, um, but at the heart of it, the message is what we are hoping to lift up this morning. We are a gentle, angry people.
Well, that was a delightful surprise that Sheila expanded the song to add trans to the original. Way to go, Sheila. Yay. Thank you for joining us this morning and for holding Lynn in such love and care. Thank you, Lynn, for trusting us, for your courage and your willingness to be here with us in this vulnerable space. And we invite you next week to come um, and hear Corporal Maddie Webb speaking about being trans in the military. We are especially gifted this month with these two speakers um, who bring us lived experience in a place where we have only been trying to understand and imagine about these, these two particular settings. And it is a remarkable gift for all of us.